I'm going to be reading chapter 6 of our book, A Good Day for Climbing Trees. When dusk fell, Mrs. Merriam put her crossword puzzles away. She got up and folded up the pink picnic blanket. The two poodles yawned and stretched themselves. Listen, you two, unfortunately it's time for me to go home, she said, but I don't want to leave you here alone. I looked at Mrs. Merriman with new eyes after that day. She might have been old and pink, but no one dared mess with her. That was a lesson my dad had learned early that afternoon. In his heyday, he had, my dad had played for the Cheetahs rugby team. If he hadn't torn a ligament, he could have played for the Springboks. Well, that was what he always told us while we watched rugby, and he downed a couple of beers. Strangely enough, not one of, th of his three sons enjoyed watching rugby with him. He was always shouting at the players, as if he was angry with each of them personally. I think Dad was actually angry that his sports shop wasn't doing too well. Donovan was the only one of us who had inherited his rugby talent, even though I suspected he enjoyed swimming more. I also played rugby for the third team, and Adrian refused to take part in sport because he said it interfered with his business dealings. My mum was still working on her high-profile case, so she had sent my dad to fetch me that afternoon. Damn it, Marnus, you're not seven years old anymore. What are you doing up there in the tree? Get down, don't make me come and get you. I was angry and anxious at the same time, and of course, mortally ashamed that Leah, Layla and Mrs Merriman were seeing and hearing everything. And then Mrs Merriman started talking to him. I wish I could remember everything she said to him, but it was basically amounted to the fact that Leah and I were incredibly brave and that she admired us for what we were doing and that my dad should give us a break. I couldn't believe it, but she managed to convince him. But it didn't help that there was a Rugby 7 series on and that one of the semi finals was on television that afternoon. As my dad walked away, he just muttered something about my mum. He wasn't going to be happy at all and that he wouldn't have to bear that brunt. We'll be okay, Mrs Merriman. Layla's voice pulled me back to the present. Don't worry, I'll stay here with with them, said a soft, serene voice. I looked down in surprise. A woman had walked up three up to the tree unnoticed. Mrs. Merriman nodded. Okay then, see you two tomorrow. She said with a small wave at Layla and me. The woman beneath the tree was standing quietly, watching Mrs. Merriman and the dogs walk away. Her long blonde hair was blowing gently in the evening breeze that had sprung up. I recognised her eyes immediately. She could only be Layla's mum, they had the same large, bright blue eyes. Layla, she said with a sigh. Layla said nothing. I waved at the lady. I'll fetch us some blankets, she said, and something to eat. I remember that Layla had said the park was close to their home. Let's see who can spot the evening star first, said Layla, when her mum had left. We sat in silence for a while. I win, she said, pointing. There, that, there it is at the tip of the branch, she laughed. Never mind, I cheated. I know exactly where it appears every night. By that time, my body was feeling as if I'd been wrestled with an elephant. One of my legs was numb. I'd been sitting on it for too long. We can't sleep up here in the tree, I said. We'll fall and break our necks. We can take turns, she suggested. The people from the municipality didn't come back today, I said. What are the chances they'll come back in the middle of the night to cut down a tree? I thought I'd heard the leaves rustle as they shrugged. I don't know, but I'm still going to take a chance, she said. You can go home if you want. I'll st I'm staying here, right here. I clambered down. Once on the ground, I jumped around swiftly until I could feel both my legs again. Then I sat down with my back against the tree trunk. A while later, Layla's mum approached in the dusk. She carried a pile of blankets in a basket. What's your name, she said, whilst putting everything down under the tree. Marnus, ma'am, I answered. I hope she knew that this was this whole tree business was her daughter's idea, not mine. A plastic bag rustled and a moment later a match was struck. She lit a few candles and placed them in a circle around the tree. Then she held a blanket out to me. I took it, feeling embarrassed. It seemed Layla and her mother didn't speak to each other, and it seemed they were equally strange. The candles placed around the tree looked like something from a movie or a storybook. I must admit, in a way I quite liked it. Layla and her mother looked like people who were used to doing things by candlelight. In our houses we only used candles during power outages, and that usually led to a mad search for candles and matches. I spread the blanket on the lawn and lay down on it. The wind had gone quiet, crickets were giving a concert in the dark, in the distance music played and 
dogs barked and over in the street a car was passed occasionally. One of the cars turned in at the park. I sat up and watched the lights slowly thread their way through the trees and come closer. The engine got louder and I had to hold my hand in front of my face to protect my eyes against the sharp light that suddenly fell on us. A door was flung open and someone approached. Manus, oh no, I should have expected this. I jumped up and quickly climbed back to the tree, into the tree. Yes, but my eyes from the safety of the bottom branch. Moths and dust were whirling in the sharp car lights. It looked like my mum's work clothes had not creased one little bit since that morning, and every strand of her hair was still in place. She looked very different from Lady's mother, with her creased, multi-coloured floral skirt and tussled limp ponytail. Enough of this nonsense, Manus. Come home. I'm going to strangle your father. I can't believe he left you here. Actually, that wouldn't have surprised her. One Saturday, my dad took us three boys to a rugby game, and afterwards he forgot Adrian at the stadium. That wasn't entirely Dad's fault. Adrian had been taking orders and was queuing for people who didn't want to go on and buy refreshments while the game was on. At a solid profit, of course. Donovan and I didn't say anything because he wanted to see how long it would take my dad to realise. Adrian was in the, in, wasn't in the car park. We were parked in our garage when he finally noticed that we, there were only three of us in the car. Marnus, get down from there. I won't tell you again. This is your last warning. I took a deep breath. Mum, I'm going to sleep here tonight. Layla and I are going to stay in the tree until the people from the municipality decide not to chop it down. I swallowed. You will always say that you have to fight for what's right. That's what Layla and I do. I thought again of the caretaker's story about the bulldozers and for some reason I felt guilty. Don't be ridiculous, Mana, she laughed. This isn't like that at all. It is, I argued. Only when we're not fighting in a court, we're fighting um, in a tree. Sometimes an idea makes a lot of sense while it's still in your head, but as soon as it slips out of your mouth, it sounds like you've been sniff, sniffing toilet spray. Mum sighed. Please, Marnus, I don't have the strength for this. It's been a long day, a long and difficult day. I'll call the municipality tomorrow and find out if the correct procedures have been followed in order to fell the tree. Maybe there's a loophole somewhere. There's nothing that you or I or... She looked at Layla's feet, peeping out from the knees like two small pale nocturnal animals. Anyone else can do about that right now. Come on down and get into the car. I'm not going home, I said resolutely. No one at home ever notices me. I'm just everyone's slave. If Donovan hadn't spit on me, you would only have found out that I was gone by tomorrow morning. Rubbish, said Mum. You don't have to climb into a bloody tree if you want attention. Her voice was rising dangerously. I suddenly felt like telling her how Donovan bullied me and how Adrian blackmailed me. That if Donovan found out that I'd squealed him on him, I, I would have to spend the rest of my life up there in the tree. And I was dependent on Adrian for pocket money for the rest of the holidays. I folded my arms. I'm staying right here. Checkmate. Mum and I glared at each other. Layla's voice, Layla's mother's cleared her throat. At least this is a safe neighbourhood, she said cautiously. Her voice soon sounded soft in comparison to my mum's. I won't leave them alone tonight. Mum and I pinched the piece of skin between her eyebrows and closed her eyelids. She always did that when she was trying to calm herself down. Then she shook her head and walked back to the car. I'd known her long enough to know that she was, she hadn't given up on this battle at all. But she was losing her temper and my mum believed that a lawyer always stayed cool and collected. The Renault's engine sputtered angrily when she drove off. When the dark noise of the car had faded, Layla stayed in the dark. You and your mum are actually very alike.